Hello and welcome to another video in the administration of operating systems course. Today we will be talking about some of the more advanced aspects of the shell as well as start talking about some typical administration tasks that are related to GNU Linux operating system. So we have already talked about what are the features of modern shells. You have hopefully had a chance to do some command line editing, command completion on the labs. There was a task about input output redirection, but there is a lot more that is interesting to investigate. So today we will go a little bit deeper into some of the more complicated aspects of it. So again, the input and output is something that you should be familiar with. You know that every process in Linux has some kind of input and some kind of output and that typically those are connected to the keyboard and the screen, but it doesn't have to be like this. It's really easy to have those commands talk to, for example, files instead. And the two special characters for doing that are the greater than and less than. One of them redirects standard output, the other one redirects standard input. And again, the important thing is both of those are handled by the shell. So the actual utility doesn't really know about this thing. So it's really hard for the utility to figure out if it's actually printing on the screen or if it's the output is being sent to a file. So in particular, the question is, does it actually make any difference if you just do, for example, cut file or if you actually use the redirection. And in practice, for most of the popular utilities, there is very little difference. Almost all of them actually accept file names as arguments, just because this is significantly less typing than this. I mean, one character is obviously a lot. So as long as those utilities are being used by a lot of people, it makes sense to program them in such a way that you can use this this kind of option. It's less typing for the user and the big benefit is that it's easier to take advantage of the wildcards. So if you want to display all the text files, for example, it's really easy to do cut star.txt. You can't really use the, kind, the same syntax with redirection. Now, in order to have this kind of functionality, you actually have to explicitly program it. If you have a program which is not very commonly used, if it's used just from time to time, it may not be worth the effort of actually going through the motions of opening the file, parsing the arguments properly, and so on. So there are some commands which just work with this one, with, in this way. Also, if you really want to go uh, deeper, the, if for some reason you want to hide the file name from the application. So if you really don't want the application to know that it's reading from file.txt, then this, uh, this form allows you to do it. So the cut command in here will never see the file.txt. In here, the command will know the file name and can do something about it. There are also some potentially interesting things related to permissions. So you can try to figure out what happens here, what happens here, and why that's the case. So those two commands will give different results, even though the, the intention is probably the same, but the way it operates is slightly different. So again, we have already talked about the common pattern of taking the output from one program, saving it to a file, and then doing something else with this file. And we have talked about potential problems related to this and the solution, which is the pipes. So a very simple but very powerful form of inter-process communication where you take the output from one program and send it directly as an input to another program. Now, important thing is that those two programs work in parallel. So both are started immediately. It's not, in this case, 
the grep finished, all the results were saved to the file and only after that the wc command started. In here both commands start at the same time. In this particular case for the wc command it doesn't make much of a difference, but there are some commands you could put here which start producing output as soon as there is some kind of input available. So then you would be seeing initial output before the first command finishes executing, which is potentially useful. You can of course combine however many commands you want, it doesn't have to be just two. And the biggest benefit here is the extreme flexibility that you can, you can achieve in this way. And especially since utilities get this for free, so you don't have to do anything special when you are writing programs like grep, any program that reads from standard input and writes to standard output, you can use together with pipes. So here are some examples of what you could be interested in doing with this. So a very simple case, you print some file, you search for something in this output, and then you count how many matches you have found. This isn't particularly impressive because instead of doing this, you can just do this. This The grep command takes and file as an argument, so there is no need to do cut before. And it actually does have a command, uh, an option for just counting how many occurrences uh, have been found. So this command can just be replaced with this one. And this, it makes sense, it's pretty common operation. Now, it's not always the case that you do something exactly like this. Sometimes you want to make something slightly more complicated. So for example, you want to search for two different words. You want to find lines which contain both the cron and the timestamp. And again, you could do it by, by using more complicated patterns for grep, but this kind of command is significantly easier. And then let's say you don't want number of lines, but you want number of words in the output. Obviously, there is no option for the grep that gives you number of words. You can't imagine that all the possible options would, would be introduced into the grep command. Some of the most common one, ones will be there, but there is a lot more possibilities than what you can reasonably expect the grep itself to have. So the big benefit of pipes is the flexibility that allows you to make use of all those reasonably simple and specialized utilities and combine them in whatever way you want. Similarly, you have already seen the redirection. So instead of sending output to another command, you can just send it to file. You can append to file. So this one will override whatever content was in the file list takes there. This one will just add it to whatever is there. So it will keep the old content and put new one at the end. And you can combine multiple commands so you know the semicolon, that means that those two will be executed one after the other. And then the parentheses means that this redirection applies the whole thing. Another example, again using semicolon in the middle, this will print something and then will be followed by the output of this. You can figure out what exactly will happen here example with more commands. So here you have four different commands. Useful thing with pipes is the T command, which in addition to printing the input on the, uh, on the standard output so that it can be uh, processed further by rest of the pipeline, it also saves it to a file. So if you want to have a copy of the output in a file and for example, display it somewhere, this is something you can use. And when you are doing some of the more complex things like this, a useful thing to know is the slash dev slash null, which is, we'll be talking a little bit more today about the dev hierarchy, but in general, those are, this is a, something sometimes called pseudo file system. So those are not actual files, those are devices. 
and the null is a specialized device which doesn't do anything. So you can send whatever data you want here and it will just disappear. So if you want to execute the command which will produce some output but you are not interested in this output and you don't want it to clutter the screen, you can just send it here and it will disappear without, without any error messages. Now, if you look at uh, pipes and redirections and try to do more complicated stuff, sooner or later you will notice that sometimes it is useful to take output from one of the commands, but instead of putting, pushing it to the standard input of another one, you would want to use this as an argument. So for example, you would like to do something like this. You would want a list of files and then change all of them, change permissions to all of them. Now, obviously, this is a very simple example. If you wanted to do it for all the files, you would just use star in here. But you can definitely imagine more complicated operations here, things that would not be possible just, just in here. For example, using find command. Now, this kind of form will obviously not work because change mode does not expect the list of files to be on standard input, it expects it to be as arguments. So there is a utility called xargs, which is useful in exactly those kinds of situations. So the actual command would look something like this. So xargs takes whatever you give on the command line, then reads the standard input and makes a single command out of this. So here is a number of uh, of examples of how xargs can be used in different setups. Now, this is a very simple case where you just pull, want to put all the arguments read from standard input at the end, but there are cases where that's not the case, where you want uh, the arguments that you receive to be used in the middle of a command. So here is an example of a special indication that this is the position where you want all the arguments to end up. So this will rename all the files, keeping the name and just adding the backup suffix. Another useful feature of shell is the alias capability. So alias is a name that shell will then translate into something else. So the most typical cases of, of using aliases is for creating a nickname for complex command. So let's say you are interested in a command like this and you assume that you will be executing it reasonably often. You of course don't want to be typing this all the time. So you define an alias called like this and then every time you type du sub, the shell will actually execute all of this. And the other useful thing about aliases is that you can use them to shadow the default behavior of some commands. So for example, if you do alias rm rm minus i, then every time you type rm, shell will actually execute rm minus i. So it can be useful for making some of the things safer for the, for the users. And what you typically want to do with aliases is you want to add them to shell startup files. We will talk about that a bit later today. So that it will be available in future sessions. If, if you just want to be using it once, that's fine. But if you are going to be using a complex command often, you want to define this alias in such a way that it stays there forever. So one way of doing it is to use uh, shell startup files. We have talked about shell variables before as well. So again, just as a reminder, a variable is a storage location. It has some name and some value. And the name is just a string of characters. You assign a value using the equality sign, and then you access the value using the dollar special character. Right? So when you do echo dollar ABC, you get the value here. On the other hand, if you do echo just ABC, you obviously get ABC. Now, shell variables are 
particularly useful where you're doing more complex processing. If you are just doing one simple command, they don't get, you don't get much benefit from them. They will be very useful later in the course when we talk about scripting, but even without scripting, there are some cases when they are useful. So for example, if you are going to be copying a lot of files to a particular location, and this location is pretty long, then you can just define a variable with this name and then you can move some files to there or you can copy some files to there and so on. And again, if what you are doing isn't very complex, then you can just make this your working directory and move all files from slash tmp slash id. But that's not always that easy. If in here, instead of just simple ls, you would be doing a number of things where it's useful to be in this particular directory, then having a short shortcut to this one is, is probably worth it. And you can use it anywhere in the, in the command line where you could use the file names or, or arguments or anything like this. Now, you have seen the quotation marks that you can use them to escape the special characters. And there are two different quotation marks that you can be using. And they actually have different behavior in regards to the shell variables. So try those two things in the command line and see what happens. Variables are also especially useful with expressions. So there is a number of special syntax uh, in bash that allows you to calculate values based on different things. So dollar parentheses, for example, will execute the command in the parentheses and assign its output to a particular variable. So you can try something like this, or you can try something like this and do, dollar parentheses parentheses will do arithmetic expression. So if you just want to do some additions or multiplications on things like that, this is one of the possible syntaxes you could, you could be using. Uh, we have also talked already about the substring, uh, string replacements, string lengths, and Sometimes it's also useful to define a special type of variable called array and you use it, you do it by putting it in parentheses. So this is not a regular string like variables we have been, you have been working before. This is an array. So there is, it's split into a number of smaller strings. So you can access each word in here separately using the square brackets. Finally, there is a number of special variables which the shell uses in order to control its behavior. One easy to see is variable called ps, which controls the command prompt. There is also actually ps2, 3 and 4 for different kinds of prompts. But the most important one is obviously ps1. This is the standard prompt you see before each command. Now you can just define it as a simple static text, so you can write whatever you want there, but it's obviously much more useful if the value is dynamic, if it displays some important information about your environment. So here is one example. This, this one displays the current username, the name of the computer, and current working directory. And this is how it would look like you can see all those special things describe different, different possibilities and you can definitely find documentation about each of those. So here is a different example. If instead we assign this kind of value to the PS1 variable, now suddenly our command prompt looks like this. Yet another example and it looks like this. Now you can also put new lines in here. I personally don't understand why, but some people really like it. And then your command prompt will look like this. So it will 
After every command, it will display some line with this information and then the actual command prompt. And there are some much more complicated things you could be trying. Those strange characters here, those are actually uh, different colors. And then you can put conditional expressions in here. So depending on what happened previously, the prompt will look differently. So here is an ex actually example of a prompt, which will be green if previous command uh, ended successfully and red if previous command finished with an error, which is kind of cool. By now, you have an idea of how the shell operates, but it's important that we go into a little bit more detail about what happens in what order and so on. So actually, interpreting a command is a multi-step process, so there is a number of things that happens. And the first thing that happens is splitting the command into tokens. So you divide it into words and you decide what is the command to be executed, what are the options and so on. And then here, obviously, the most important things are the spaces, but there are also other characters that, that are used at this stage. So the parentheses, the semicolon, the double ampersand and so on. The next step is expanding aliases, which is reasonably simple. But after that, there is variable substitution. And well, obviously here, the important special character is the dollar sign. After that, you expand the file name white cards. So all of those things that you have also seen before. Next, you set up input and output redirection. So both the file redirection as well as the pipes. So as I mentioned, this is something that's done by the shell even before the command gets executed. And only after all those things are done, the resulting command is actually executed. Now, there are two different kinds of commands that can be executed. Some of them are so-called shell built-ins. So the, here is a partial list of those. The most important of them is, of course, the CD. And some of those commands could be the ex could be external utilities. So external utilities are just executable files. So any program can be can be executed like this. So for example, echo is an ex is a command which is both external. There is actually a program called echo in one of the directories. But it's also typically built into shells just because it's more efficient this way. But some of those commands wouldn't make any sense if they were not uh, built-ins. So for example, cd is a command which, only, which can only work as the built-in. So you can definitely think about why cd could never be an external command. So this also explains why if you try to do man cd, it won't really work. On the other hand, if you do man echo, it will work, but there is some chance that it will show you the wrong version of echo. So the, the actual command echo, while if you type echo, it will execute the shelled building. You may want to try if there are any differences in, 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 in options or arguments and see if you can find out which version of echo is actually executed. Now, if you want to get help about commands like cd, the best place to try is man bash. Now, the, this is a very long man page, so there's a lot of reading here, but one of the things that uh, this man page includes is information about all the, all the building commands. Now, if something is not a built-in command, then it's supposed to be external utility, so it has to be some kind of executable file, and shell has to find it. The way shell does it is it looks at the path variable, so here is an example of how a path variable could look like. So shell checks each of those directories, one after the other, looking for the command name that you have just given. So if you type ls-l, for example, in the first step, shell will figure out that the command you want is ls, minus l is the argument. So it will keep looking in those directories until it finds one which contains executable called ls, and then it will execute it with the appropriate, uh, appropriate 
arguments. So as a reminder, the number of special characters, a little bit grouped by function. So you should know basically all of those. Those are the important ones that if, if you don't know what they do, it's it means that it's some, something more that you should learn. Uh, this one will be important later when we talk about scripts. And then there is a number of uh, less important special characters which you probably don't have to worry about so much. At least, well, especially if we are talking about those, when they are alone. Like combination of parentheses and braces with, for example, uh, dollar sign, those we have talked about, those are important. But some of those have, uh, they have special meaning in special contexts. So in a lot of cases, this is something that you don't really have to worry about. Now, I have talked about startup files before. Now, in a sense, we are moving a little bit away from just using the operating system and more towards administrating it. So the idea is that if you are going to be using a particular system a lot, you want to adapt it to your, uh, to your style of working. And one way of doing it is to use startup or configuration files. So the idea is to adapt, for example, shell to your preferences. So you typically have a number of files in your home directory, which are executed by the shell when it starts. And you can put commands in there to change the default settings. Now, there is a lot of those files, depending on what kind of shell you are using. Bash has its own. There are some which are used by other kinds of the shell. And then there are some which are shared between different kinds of the shell. But also an important concept is different types of shell. For example, there are login shells. So this is the shell which is executed when you log into the machine. So when you, for example, start the console or if you connect via Telnet or SSH. And those kinds of shell will execute, for example, those files when you start. So you may take a look at those files. The syntax is pretty complicated. We'll be talking more about scripting later, but some of the things you should be able to understand from there. So for other shells, for example, when you create a new terminal or if you just execute the bash command, those will be called interactive shells. So those are not login shells. Login shell is one when you log in. And after that, you can create an, any number of interactive shells. And those will read those kinds of configuration files. And then finally, there are some non-interactive shells. So those are when you execute, for example, scripts, that's shell which is not supposed to interact directly with the user. It's just supposed to execute some number of commands and then finish. So for example, if you have read the book, it says that directory bin in your home, di home directory is automatically added to each user's path variable. Now, if on default Ubuntu installation you do echo path, you will not see it. There will, no, there will be no uh, till the bin directory there. On the other hand, if you do, if you create such directory, because this directory doesn't exist. Now, if you create it, log out and then log in again, suddenly the path variable will change. Now echo path will show it. You may also notice that simply starting a new shell is not enough. So now if you remember what I was talking here, this indicates that the magic that sets up this variable has to be somewhere here. And in fact, if you look at the profile file, you will see something like this. And again, we will be talking later about the if command, but if you think about what if means in English, it's 
reasonably similar in, in bash scripting is the conditional operation. So it first checks if this directory exists and if yes, then it adds it to the current value of the path. Now, this line you should be able to understand. This one is important. This shows you, for example, how to add something to existing value of a variable. Talking more about administration, you, are, you should be familiar by now with the concept of root. The root actually has two different meanings. One is the highest level in the file system hierarchy, but it also means the special user account, which is used for system administration. It's sometimes also called super user. And the reason why there is a, such a special account is that from time to time you need to do operations which bypass regular system permissions. So for example, you need to be editing global configuration files, files that regular users are not supposed to be edit. You need to, you want to be able to change file ownership. Again, this is operation that regular users cannot do. Sometimes you have to kill processes that belong to other users. And getting, for example, direct access to hardware and so on. Now, this root user definitely should not be used for regular work. All the regular user accounts are perfectly usable. So whenever you are doing actual work, you should be using your regular user account and you should only use root when necessary. And the preferred way of using root is to use the sudo command. So actually, you don't really want to log in as root, you just want to execute individual commands as, as the root account. So the syntax is like this. And the big benefit is that you can do this without logging as root, without actually knowing root's password, and with more fine-grained control. So if you give, if you are an administrator of a system and you give some user root password, then they can do anything, whatever they want on the whole system. That's probably not a very smart idea. Now with sudo, you can give users permission to execute anything, but you can also say that particular user is only allowed to use some number of commands. So for example, you could have a user which is allowed to add users, but not to remove users and so on. So that would be pretty, pretty interesting. You have all actually already used the sudo command on the, on the labs. So this is exactly, exactly what happened. And obviously just add user set would not work because your regular account does not have permissions to add users. So as I said, you can actually access root normally, you can log in as root, but you have to enable it first. And it's very rarely a good idea to enable it. There is almost, almost never the reason to do it. Sudo is perfectly enough for almost uh, almost all work you you want to be doing. Now, actually the simplest way to get root privileges is to use something called recovery mode. So this is a mode in which system is put in a single user mode. So there is only one user that can log in. You don't need to specify password to log in. And typically this is quite trivial to do if you have physical access to the machine. So this is one of the reasons why security or, or kind of network security is only as good as the actual physical security. If you get physical access to the machine, there is almost nothing that uh, can be done to prevent you from, from getting access to it. So this is kind of interesting and something that not everybody knows. The second, the most common way, not the simplest, but the most common way to uh, get root privileges is to actually run a program which has so-called set user ID permission. And one example of such a program is passwd. 
if you whenever you are executing pass wd you are actually getting root privileges so this is uh, this is something worth knowing so there is obviously a man page for sudo which explains more or less how to use it and the interesting thing is that there is a configuration file called etc sudoers which specifies for example who is allowed to do to execute sudo who is allowed to execute what kind of commands with sudo and so on and now it's very important that you don't edit this file in for example nano or any other random editor there is a specialized editor called vsudo which before saving the file will actually check if it has the correct syntax because if you break this file if you do some changes which are not correct so that the file is unreadable or, or the sudo program cannot understand it you will actually lose lose the ability to uh, to access root and that means it will be really hard to do anything useful on the system. So here is an example of how this file looks like. Uh, I will not go into too much detail right now, but it's important to just get an overall idea of, of what happens here. The syntax of the file is pretty simple. It has some commands and, and some values to those. Lines starting with the hash sign are just comments, so they don't don't have any particular meaning. And then you can specify some kind of user aliases, so classes of users, specifying usernames. You can specify classes of commands, so different, for example, different ways of uh, shutting down the computer. And then you can say that, for example, operator users has have access to all the shutdown commands and all the commands in this uh, directory but not to, to everybody else and users of the admin group have access to all the commands and so on so if if you ever edit this file make sure that you understand the syntax because making mistakes here can be pretty dangerous now you also had a little bit of experience during the labs with creating new users. There are actually two different commands for creating users. The basic one is called user add, which just adds the entry to, uh, to the etc password file, the, pa the file which contains the list of all the users. Uh, and it may create the home directory depending on the options that you specify. There are some default options that uh, specify how the users will be created. So for example, uh, how many days the password will be valid, whether to create home or not, whether to make log of all the correct and failed logins and so on. Uh, and then there is also a more interactive uh, front end to it called add user, which will actually ask a number of questions about the user to fill the information properly. So this one is probably easier to use unless you are doing it from some kind of automated system or something like this. I mentioned the TC password. This is the text-based database about users. So this actually is kind of a historical artifact for in modern computers. It's used for simple workstations. So for a, for an installation like the Ubuntu virtual machine, this is actually where the main information about all the users is stored. For a bigger systems, obviously the, the data about users is stored either in some kind of database or uh, in some network-based authentication server or things like that. But for small workstation, the etc password is still uh, still the, the main source of information about users. Now, the name suggests that the file contains the passwords of users, and that's what originally happened, but that's not, that's not true anymore. On modern systems, there are no passwords in, in this file. And the reason is that this file has to be readable for everybody, because applications need to 
look up usernames and information about it. But giving users a list of all passwords is a serious security vulnerability, even if the passwords are encrypted. It's just so easy to run brute force cracking. If there is no control, you can try a lot of different passwords really fast and probably will be able to, to crack at least some of them. So in modern systems, there is another file called etc shadow, which stores the actual encrypted passwords and only root can read this file. So similarly to adding users, there are two commands for adding groups, which in principle work kind of similarly. Uh, and they can be also used to change the groups to which, uh, to which user belongs. And there is a number of groups which have, to some degree at least, common meaning. So there is very often a group called users, which to which all the real users belong. There is a group called daemon, to which the users who are not really humans, but are just created for administration purposes for individual services belong. There is usually a user called nobody, which basically have no permissions. So this is the user you would, uh, you would use when you have to well, you don't expect to need particular permissions, but you need some, some user, especially in network related stuff, just, just for, in order to be, to be as safe as possible. There are often groups related to individual devices. So there might be a group for all the users who are allowed to use the CD-ROM and things like that. Also by default, especially, or at least on Ubuntu, each user will have their own group. So whenever you create a new user, for example, Slavek, that user will have, will be a member of its own group. Uh, but it will also typically be a member of, of other groups as well. So a user can belong to many groups. We have also talked about file permissions before. So you specify RWX permissions for owner group and others. Now the Owner and others is kind of self-explanatory, but group permissions are, I think, a little bit more interesting. So every file has a user ownership and group ownership. So it belongs to a particular user, it belongs to a particular group. And those can be changed with change owner and change group. And similarly, since a user can belong to many groups, one of them is always primary, and this is the group to which new files belong. So if you have the user ID and the primary group is called ID, then when you create a new file, this file will belong to group ID as well. Now this isn't always what you want, but it makes sense in a lot of, a lot of setup. However, if you think about how, for example, collaboration between, between users would look like, you can imagine a situation where you have three users, Alice, Bob, and Carol, and they work on different projects, X, Y, and Z. And now the question is how to set up permissions for those, uh, for those files in such a way that users can, work, can modify files belonging to their projects, but cannot modify files belonging to other projects. So you can think about it for a little bit. Now would be a good time to pause the video for a little bit and see if you can figure out how to do it. The best way of doing it is to create a separate group for each project and then add each user to the group, uh, to, to the projects on which they are supposed to be working. Now, the issue here is that adding group, users to groups, as well as removing users from groups, requires root privileges. So this is not something that, for example, Alice can do on their own. So that means that every, if you want to use this kind of approach, and every time you add people to a project or remove people from project, you need to involve the administrator, which probably isn't, isn't the optimal solution. So Sometimes 
Uh, on one of the previous lectures, I have talked about access control list, which might be a better way of doing it. Uh, but in general, if if projects are reasonably stable, this is the perfectly valid solution. Now, one issue here is that it requires some extra work when creating new files, because if you just create new files, it would belong to user's primary group and not to any of the projects. So you either have to change the group by hand, or you could use the set group ID permissions to for a particular directory, for example, to say that all files created in project X directory should belong to project X group. That will solve some of the issues. The other thing which is very important for uh, operating system uh, work is job and process control. So I have already talked about uh, running programs in foreground and running programs in background and about the job, the ps and the jobs commands, about control c, control z keys, about killing commands, about ps and kill. This is just, just a short reminder because now Let's talk a little bit more detail about what a process actually is. So again, as a reminder, program is the data on a hard disk. It's a sequence of instructions and some initial data. But once you start executing it, it becomes a process. So this is an active thing and it, the operating system needs to have a lot of information about it, its current state. So in Important thing is also there may be many copies of the same program, so you may have multiple processes, for example, multiple different LS processes, all printing contents of different directories. So from operating system point of view, process can be in a number of different states. The most obvious one is obviously running, so this is the process which is being executed or waiting to be scheduled in the CPU. So you know that uh, the multitasking that you can see on modern computers is in general mostly uh, just an illusion. There is just a one, or for modern CPUs might be more, but there is the processes spend most of the time actually waiting for, for access to CPU and they are just switching very fast. So you get a, the user gets a feeling of, of running multiple processes in parallel, but very often they are actually running sequentially. But from operating system point of view, this kind of process is, is running. It's ready. As soon as it gets access to CPU, it will be doing something. The other state is, stuck, is when the process is waiting for some event, for example, completion of input-output operation, or waiting for some kind of system call. Those are important for operating system because it means that this process at some point will continue running, but right now it's not. So even if there is some CPU available, this process cannot continue running until the opera IO operation will finish. Uh, Task can be stopped, so this is what happens when you press Ctrl Z, Z. Again, this is a process which operating system doesn't really have to care about all that much. It's not going to be running until something happens. And then there are a couple of more exotic uh, states that are not that important. So the process can be stopped by a debugger. The process may be in a so-called zombie state, so it has finished execution, but its parent process has not yet uh, has not yet done the so-called wait system call, so it has not yet collected information about this process. So some of the information still needs to be kept because the parent process may ask about it later. And then there is a dead state where the information about process is basically being removed. And depending on what happens, this the process typically 
moves from one state to the other. But all the time, the operating system has to keep in memory a lot of information about the process. So some of it is listed here, that's not all. Here is a more visual representation of how it can look like. There is a number of different things associated with it. The other concept is threads. So they are conceptually similar to processes, which are sometimes even called lightweight processes. And like processes, they contain their own instruction count, register set, and stack, but they share a lot of information with other threads from the same program. So for example, all the code, the data memory, things like file descriptor table, and so on. So those are simpler, smaller things. You can have multiple threads within a single process if, uh, if you want to execute it this way. Important concept, you have seen it already when we talked about the ps and kill commands, is the process ID. So every task has its own structure in the kernel memory and the kernel guarantees that the process ID is always unique. The tricky thing is that if you have a multi-threaded application, each thread actually has its own feed, but from the point of view of the user, there should be a single process ID for the whole process. So each thread, that for each process, there is some kind of thread group leader, and this is the process, the, the PID which will be returned when you do the get PID uh, system call. Now, when you are creating new process, you are actually doing two things. There is no, uh, no system call for just creating a new process with a particular data. What you do is you first call the so-called fork operation. So you make a copy of the current process and it inherits all the data, both the program code, code instruction count, and so on. And then you call the exec system call, which actually loads new program code. So when you want to execute a new a different program, you still start by copying the current process and then replacing the data with the new one. And if you think about, again, how complicated the task structure is, there are two ways of doing it. So you can do so-called shallow copy. This is what happens when you create a new thread. So you copy this structure, but all the data that is deeper is kept. Uh, shared, so things like file descriptors, for example, all this information will be shared between, between the threads. And for heavyweight processes or the real processes, what you actually should do is so-called deep copy. So you should copy both this and this information. But in order to do it faster, what Linux does is actually uses a technique called copy on write. So it doesn't make the copy immediately. At the beginning, the parent and child share the memory because as long as both are just reading data, there is not a problem, that that's perfectly fine. You only have to make a copy when one of them tries to modify the memory contents. Another important concept is that of signals. So those are very short messages that you can send to a process or to a group of processes. And those will often arrive while process is doing something else. They will interrupt the normal code. So then the idea is that signal handler typically does not really do any real work in, in trying to do whatever the, the signal is supposed to make the program do, but it will only set a flag and then next time the program is in consistent state, then it will do the actual work. This is, this is how you typically do. Now, the most common use for signals, there is a number of different signals that you can be using. 
but the most common one is uh, just using the kill command to just kill the process, so to, to stop it. But there are other, other possibilities as well. So kill followed by process ID is the most, the most common one, but that, that's not the only possibility, there are others as well. There are other ways of doing inter-process communication, so if you want to have multiple uh, utilities that can talk to each other, the most obvious way of doing it is of course to use file system, uh, but you can use pipes, you can use semaphores, different kinds of messages and so on, there is a lot of, you can use network, there is a lot of, a lot of different possibilities uh, that are provided by the, by the operating system, so this is important to understand how the operating system works together with that. Uh, we have talked about file systems before, but besides the file systems that actually reside on the disk, there are also so-called virtual or pseudo file systems. So those have structure and access patterns similar to those of regular files, but the actual data is not stored on disk. So the idea is to make communication between applications and kernel easier. You don't need to have special, specific protocols for accessing it. You can just treat those things as files. So one common thing is the dev directory. It's location of special device files. So those are files corresponding to devices. And it's not really used directly nowadays all that much. It used to be uh, much more common before. Although we have talked about slash dev slash node before. So this is one of the cases. There is, for example, slash dev slash urandom as well, which is sometimes used. But the more interesting uh, virtual file system is the prots file system, which actually contains information about processes. So both about individual processes, when you have slash plus prots slash process ID, and also information about the kernel. So things like version, some statistics and so on. There are also two important standards that are worth talking about. First one is POSIX, which is basically so-called portable operating system interface. So the idea is that systems like Unix, Solaris, BSD and Linux are similar but not exactly identical. So the idea is to define uh, some parts of kernel programming interface some number of system tools and some capabilities of system shell in order to make portable applications. So applications that can run on a number of different systems. And then the other standard is Linux standard base. Since there is no well-defined GNU Linux system, there is a lot of different distributions. And POSIX is not enough, it's too general. So there is a number of differences between distributions that you would like to make to minimize. So Linux standard base is a family of standards and recommendations about how, for example, what, what libraries should be installed by default, how the file system hierarchy should look like, and similar things. Finally, I wanted to talk about software installation. So software installation can be done by hand. It's pretty common or it used to be pretty common to install software from source code because basic programming tools currently are not really installed by default under most distributions, but are very easy to add. And in GNU Linux, it's typically very easy to compile programs. So you would run the configure script, which looks at the configuration of, of your machine and adapts the a building system to, to what you have, then you would make the application and finally you would install it. And if all the dependencies are present, those three commands would compile the application, install it and have it ready to run. Now, you typically want to have something more powerful than that. You want some kind of package manager because you want, for example, to have a list of installed packages you want to handle updates automatically, you want to have possibility of removing those applications and so on. And one package manager in Linux is called Aptitude, which is a front end to 
family of tools called the APT. And the most important of those is apt-get. So you can do apt-get install and the name of the package that you want to install. You have update, upgrade and so on as well. Uh, there is apt-cache command and those commands use configuration file called slash etc apt sources list which specifies the repositories where the tool is supposed to look for packages to download. So the entry in this file could look something like this. So it specifies that you can access the files using FTP and then specify to which distribution does this repository belong. So those would be, for example, stable uh, sources. And it allows you to specify if you want to download binary or sort distributions, different access protocols, and so on. Uh, and actually, the actual installation of, of packages is handled by program on yet lower level called DPKG. So this one is not capable of downloading uh, packages on the, or finding them in repository on its own. It just handles them once they are they are downloaded. So you can, if you download a particular package, you can just install it, and it done, does a number of of interesting things, making sure that the uh, that that you unpack the control files, you execute uh, some scripts for removing earlier versions, you prepare system for installation. You unpack the actual files, you create configuration files if necessary, and then you finalize the installation as well. And the important thing about Package Manager is that it also allows you to handle conflicts. When installing a particular package, you may override a file from another application or have different versions of the same tool and so on. So you can specify that you want to keep a particular version uh, with different priorities and, and things like that. Hopefully, in most cases, it's not necessary. A lot of applications just work fine. But if it turns out that there are some conflicts, uh, apt tools give you a lot of flexibility into how to handle it. So that's it for today, and I will see you on the lecture.